Do you know who the scruffy man is? That's right, he is the renowned Julius Caesar, he never claimed the title of emperor, yet European historians regard him as the true first emperor of the Roman Empire. At this stage, however, he's just a powerless, debt-ridden, down-and-out young man. Caesar comes from a distinguished family with many notable ancestors. But by now, the family has fallen into decline. Caesar himself is brave and strategic, but his disdain for superiors and insubordination have made him a thorn in the side of those in power. Despite having achieved several military accomplishments, Caesar never received the promotion he deserved. Crassus greatly appreciates Caesar's abilities. Since Caesar is in dire need of money, they quickly form an alliance. Crassus provides financial support to Caesar. In return, Caesar helps him defeat the slave rebellion led by Spartacus. Crassus is also a very shrewd man. After the frontline generals were killed by Spartacus, leaving the army without a leader, the wealthy and powerful Roman tycoon Crassus funded and assembled an army of 10,000 men himself to oppose Spartacus's rebel forces. He aimed to earn military honors to gain political influence and establish a significant reputation. Crassus's army is now fully assembled, and the Senate is urging him to deploy. However, Crassus is in no hurry to leave, repeatedly checking the readiness of supplies and weapons. The procurement of weapons is managed by Tiberius. Tiberius is delighted, eager to show his worth as a powerful deputy to his father. However, Caesar's arrival as a competitor causes some concern for Tiberius. Crassus hosts Caesar at his mansion. Unrestrained Caesar takes a fancy to Corre, a female slave serving him. But what Caesar does not know is that the young and beautiful Corre is Crassus's lover. Just when Caesar wants something to happen, Crassus shows up just in time and tells Corre to leave. Tiberius learns of Corre's insult by Caesar. Tiberius and Corre have a very close relationship, with Corre always caring for him. Tiberius, wanting to confront Caesar, accidentally overhears his father and Caesar discussing strategy. Crassus has thoroughly studied Spartacus. Knowing his past and combat habits, Crassus believes that conventional tactics won't work against Spartacus, a view that coincides with Caesar's. Crassus, as if finding a kindred spirit, praises Caesar and simultaneously criticizes Tiberius for his recklessness. Tiberius, eavesdropping outside, grows even more resentful of Caesar. That night, an angry Tiberius confronts Caesar, only to find a female slave on his lap and drops of blood on the floor. Tiberius thinks Caesar is indulging his base desires. Little does he know, this act by Caesar will be key to defeating Spartacus later on. Tiberius warns Caesar not to vie for the position of deputy commander and to stay away from Corre. But Caesar is not provoked by Tiberius's words and retorts sharply. Their first meeting ends on a sour note. The day of the campaign finally arrived, and they went to Crassus's room. What Caesar didn't expect was that Crassus still appointed Tiberius as his deputy. Crassus asked Caesar to assist Tiberius and depart early to gather the remnants of Cassinius and Furius's troops, while he would follow with the main force. Caesar was very displeased, not expecting to be commanded by a mere boy. I've spread coin towards your election as military tribune. Formal title Tiberius is yet too young to hold. Wear my token to pass unmolested through encampment until appearance is shorn to Roman likeness. I prefer fancy sword and expected position. Stay upon path I have set and see greater glories bestowed at journey's end. After some persuasion from Crassus, Caesar reluctantly agreed to the arrangement. Then they arrived outside the military camp. Crassus issued the order for the entire army to strike. We advance south on Spartacus and those who follow him in rebellion. Let our shadow fall upon them. And every man, woman and child so touched by it, struck from this world by the might and glory of Rome. Soon after, Tiberius and Caesar's vanguard troops set up camp about 100 kilometers away from Spartacus. At this time, a soldier from the city of Sinuessa informed Tiberius that Spartacus's rebel army had occupied their city. No sooner had the soldier finished speaking than Caesar chopped off his head with a single stroke of his sword. Caesar, who loathed deserters, used this act to vent his dissatisfaction towards Tiberius. Caesar's insubordination greatly insulted Tiberius, who loudly berated him. Asserting his authority as the leader here, Tiberius also took this opportunity to send Caesar away. This move was exactly what Caesar wanted, as he had no desire to be associated with this young upstart. At this moment, Caesar was plotting another grand plan to earn merit, to prove himself and regain his dignity. Tiberius immediately ordered his army to prepare for an attack on the city of Sinuessa. 
He led the troops to ambush outside the city, observing the terrain for the assault. Unexpectedly, he stumbled upon Spartacus's trade with the pirates, which thrilled Tiberius. He immediately ordered his men to annihilate them. Eager to prove his capabilities with a decisive victory, Tiberius acted rashly, he had completely forgotten his father's advice. Before departing, Crassus had strictly ordered Tiberius not to act recklessly or confront Spartacus directly until his arrival. Meanwhile, Spartacus's deal with the pirates was not going smoothly either, Spartacus had brought the money for purchasing food as agreed. However, Heraclio tricked him, not bringing the needed supplies, as he did not trust Spartacus. Just as the situation became tense, an arrow suddenly flew in from afar. We have a train! This is not my hand! In fact, this incident had nothing to do with the pirates. Seeing the Roman soldiers aggressively approaching, the pirates and rebels united in their hostility and fought together. The Roman soldiers were no match for the rebels and pirates. Unexpectedly, a large reinforcement of Roman troops arrived in a mighty procession. At the critical moment, Heraclio threw a torch into the sky, receiving the signal. The pirates ambushed at sea fired their dark weapons at the Roman army. Testolo! The pirates' combat effectiveness was indeed astonishing. In an instant, the entire Roman army was thrown into chaos, abandoning their armor and fleeing in disarray. Even as Tiberius repeatedly ordered no retreat, who would listen to him? The rebels thrust a sword at Tiberius's body, luckily missing the vital parts. Tiberius, reluctantly and with help from his subordinates, fled the battlefield. Pass down your thoughts now, King Spartacus. Say coin. See your ships to port. After this incident, trust was established between Heraclio and Spartacus, leading them to decide on an official collaboration. However, when Spartacus and others returned to the city, they saw Adius's body, seeing his brother dead. Gannicus was heartbroken when he learned that it was Naivia who killed him. Gannicus couldn't believe the accusations of Adius's betrayal, and this would become the cause of the future rift between Gannicus and Crixus. The people unloading accidentally spilled a jar of corn on the dock. However, in the next second, a dozen refugees rushed like wild wolves, grabbing the corn and stuffing it into their mouths. A man rushed up to punch the refugees but was quickly stopped by Spartacus. He ordered his men to allow each person to take a handful of food every three days and forbade them from mistreating the refugees. This was the current living situation of the citizens. Ever since Spartacus led the rebel army to occupy the city, Crassus's Roman army had blocked land transportation to the area, with no other choice. Spartacus had to buy food at a high price from pirates via sea transport, but Heraclio took advantage of the situation, jacking up the price of food, saying that it was difficult to get due to the ongoing war outside, thus raising the price of food. Spartacus was angry but dared not express it. If he fell out with Heraclio at this time, all the rebels and refugees in the city would starve, so he had to swallow his anger. Crixus and Naivia repeatedly urged Spartacus to execute the remaining Roman captives arguing that they couldn't waste food on them. However, Spartacus refused. If they killed innocents indiscriminately, how were they different from the Romans they hated? What worried them more was that a large number of slaves outside the city wanted to join the rebel army. They were their compatriots. And Spartacus, of course, couldn't refuse them. A slave brought news of Crassus's army, saying that Crassus had set up camp less than half a day's journey away, with a camp area larger than the city of Sinuessa. But they showed no signs of attacking. This puzzled Spartacus and the others. Just at this moment, suddenly about a dozen Romans, disguised among the slaves, attempted to assassinate Spartacus. Spartacus immediately ordered the city gates to be closed and swiftly dealt with the assassins sent by Crassus. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Seeing this man continuously stabbing one of the soldiers, Spartacus expressed his gratitude to him. But what Spartacus didn't know was that this person was also a spy sent by Crassus. And he is Caesar. In order for Caesar to prove his slavery, Spartacus made him show his slave brand. My Dominus branded all his slaves close to <laughs> Equally enjoyed upon drunken nights. With that knife, I rid myself of him and his mark. Hold the cover. And join the others. This assassination attempt made Spartacus realize the terror of Crassus and the reason for his inaction. He found that Crassus's tactics differed from other Roman generals, being extremely cunning and difficult to deal with. Now many unknown people were mixed into the city, and it was unclear who might be spies. Spartacus prepared for the worst, deciding that if he was assassinated, Crixus would take his place. He asked Crixus and Gannicus to train the new recruits while looking out for suspicious individuals. He and Agron find Leda and try to get more information out of her about Crassus, but Spartacus didn't notice that Leda was hiding a dozen Roman nobles in a secret passage under the stables. Leda told Spartacus that Crassus was a man of many schemes and determination, stopping at nothing to achieve his goals. He became the wealthiest man in Rome by outmaneuvering his opponents in every way. Spartacus then realized that the deaths of the two generals he had killed earlier were also Crassus's schemes. Afterward, Spartacus approached Heraclio to discuss the ongoing food procurement, but he was unaware that a horrific massacre was about to unfold in the city. Crixus and Gannicus followed Spartacus's orders and trained the new recruits. On the training field, Gannicus spotted Caesar among the crowd and called him to fight. During the fight, Gannicus realized that Caesar's swordsmanship was extremely skilled, not like that of an ordinary slave. Caesar lied, claiming he was a shepherd and had basic training. This was the first time Gannicus and Caesar clashed. Though Caesar fought hard, he was no match for the god of the arena. The defeated Caesar exhibited a tenacity and ferocity unusual for ordinary men. Crixus noticed this and immediately instructed Nemetz to verify Caesar's identity. Nemetz, dissatisfied with Spartacus's decision not to kill the Roman captives, decided to test Caesar. He concealed from Spartacus that he had imprisoned a Roman noblewoman. Before this, Nemetz had brutally tormented Fabia, who was already covered in scars. Nemetz demanded Caesar harm Fabia in his way, and refusal would prove something was wrong with Caesar. And when you're finished, leave a fresh mark upon her, as we have so often done. Seeing his compatriot, how could Caesar bear to hurt her? He revealed his identity to Fabia and told her that Crassus's army would soon take the city, asking her to endure a little longer. But Fabia had only one request. She begged Caesar to kill her quickly, not wanting to endure another moment of torture. Ultimately, Caesar, with tears in his eyes, ended Fabia's painful life. I set her free. As I would all Romans yet held by Spartacus. You truly do stand one of us. Come, brother. Let us see it done. Caesar successfully passed the test. Nemetz brought Fabia's body to the square, falsely claiming that the woman had tried to assassinate him but was saved by Caesar, confirming Caesar's identity and also igniting the anger in the hearts of those who wanted to kill the Roman captives, including Crixus and Naivia. <laughs> Meanwhile, Leda secretly brought some bread to feed the Romans hidden in the underground passage. A female slave accidentally stumbled upon Leda and found her suspicious, so she followed Leda and discovered the hidden captives. Sybil, previously saved by Gannicus and admiring him greatly, informed him about this. Gannicus immediately goes to the cellar and discovers that Leda is hiding Romans. He also learned that his friend Adius was wrongfully killed by Naedia, which enraged him. He ordered Saxa to tie them up and bring them to Spartacus, while he went to confront Naedia. But Naedia showed no remorse, insisting that all Romans deserved to die. Deserved fate. He was my friend, you mad! Be strong, brother! <laughs> Crixus and Gannicus got into a fight, with Nemetz rushing to break it up, but they were too entangled to separate easily. Gannicus elbows Nemetz out of the way, but the Romans behind him tie a chain around Nemetz's neck. Caesar watched all this. In order to make the situation worse, he killed the Roman with a dagger in his hand. Meanwhile, Crixus was pinned down by Gannicus. At a critical moment, 
Naedia picked up a rock and knocked Ganicus unconscious. Caesar took this opportunity to incite further chaos. Did we risk our lives in this rebellion only to end up slaughtering each other? We owe Spartacus our own lives. Yet he is wrong in this. Nothing normal. For every unwanted touch placed upon you. For every chain around neck. And every lash upon back. Take Roman blood as payment. And let us see this city. <laughs> Under Naedia's instigation, Crixus led a horrific massacre, they slaughtered any Romans they encountered without hesitation, and in an instant, the entire city turned into a hellish bloodbath. On the other side, Spartacus had already reached an agreement with Heraclio. When Nasir rushed in to inform Spartacus about the chaos outside, he immediately went to the scene. Meanwhile, Saxa, following Gannicus's order, desperately tried to bring Leda and several Romans to Spartacus. Unfortunately, they encountered the frenzied rebels. Crixus arrived just as he was about to execute Leda, but Spartacus arrived in time. Crixus, blinded by rage, demanded Spartacus kill Leda or end their friendship. Spartacus was torn. He questioned Leda about why she had the captives. This is return. For the mercy I grant you. Mercy. You robbed me of my husband. Your people slaughtered thousands within my city. And I now stand condemned for trying to save but a handful from such cruelty. Learned at the hand of our Roman master. Take her life, brother. And in the act, it has become as one again. After thinking, Spartacus realized that if he did so, he would be no different from their enemies. He refused Crixus's request and ordered the remaining captives to be brought to his courtyard, declaring that anyone who dared to kill captives, regardless of who they were, would only face death. The man has helped us more than anyone, yet I now doubt how he travels. And perhaps the time has come to forge our own. Crixus resolved to lead those who followed him and permanently part ways with Spartacus. 